Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Welcome, everybody. So today, the main thought of today's worship service is the divine call. So um, the divine call is actually a church term. It's a ecclesiastical term. And it refers to the call into the public ministry. So in the church, uh, we sometimes refer to people like myself as in the public ministry. Public means representative. So some people have been called to represent a group of Christians, and they are in what we call the public ministry. And the call to go into the public ministry is called the divine call. And don't confuse that with a call that is even more important to you personally, and that's the gospel call. All of us have received a call from God it's literally the gospel message comes to us in the form of baptism and also the, the, the Bible. And that's the call to believe in Jesus Christ and trust in him as our Savior. All of us have received that call. But today, we're going to be focusing on the divine call into the public ministry and how important that is. Okay? I think that's... 
that's uh, a worthy uh, topic for us to uh, focus a worship service on. Of course, it all is about sharing the Word of God and learning God's Word. So our first hymn, appropriately, is God's Word is our great heritage. Don't forget that this is also a service where we will serve Holy Communion. So remember to examine yourself as you've been taught in your confirmation classes. God's Word is our great heritage is how we will begin. God bless your worship.
eighth Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and bring forth fruits and faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. So the congregation may be seated. And as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, today's worship service focuses around the divine call, so all the readings will also focus on the divine call. And again, bear in mind that um, for you personally, you know, the most important call is your call to faith in Jesus Christ. But for the health of the church, for the growth of the church, God has also established something called the divine call, where he calls some people into the public ministry. And those calls vary. They vary in scope, and they vary in, in levels of responsibility. So the, the congregational pastor has a different level of responsibility than the synod president. And a councilman has a different level of responsibility, a lesser level of responsibility than a pastor who's been called to oversee all the work in the congregation. A Sunday school teacher, again, a, a smaller level of responsibility, just she's watching over the, the uh, few members of her class. A BBS teacher, also called into public ministry, called to represent the congregation. But only for a few days and only for the people that are in his or her class. So the divine call is the subject here. And the first lesson is actually the sermon text, so I'm going to hold off on that. It's from the book of Amos, but we'll hear that later. So we're going to move right into the psalm of the day, which speaks about how blessed we are to have the word of God. It's because God wants us to have the word of God in rich measure that he has established the divine call and the public ministry. So um, we will sing the words on there on the screen. It's a special arrangement of Psalm 1, which compares someone with God's word to a tree that's planted by a stream.
Timothy, and he's explaining the qualifications of those people who uh, are to be called into the uh, public ministry. He says, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So that is our second lesson, and our verse of the day reminds us of, because of the uh, public ministry, because of the divine call, we have the word in rich measure. Deuteronomy 30, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may obey it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Okay, that's called a brand. 
So sometimes farmers will put a design on the side of the cows to indicate that that's their cow. Okay. So did you know that God has given you a sign that you are his own? It's called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in you. And the Holy Spirit makes you want to do the things that Jesus wants you to do. Like listen to his word. Like right now you're listening to me, right? Okay. And I'm your pastor. And that means that the Holy Spirit is in you. Okay. And that's the sign that you are his, his dear child in this kingdom. He loves you very, very much. Now you'll always be the children of your parents. I don't want to scare you. So Greg and Eileen will always be your parents. All right. But God also says you are my child and loves you very, very much. And the, the sign of that, the seal of that, is the Holy Spirit. Okay? So let's bow our heads and pray. It's a little bit of a complicated concept, but we did our best. Okay? So we'll pray. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. That is a sign, a seal, that we are yours. We pray that the Holy Spirit would come into us in greater measure as we hear your word and grow in our faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. All right, thanks for listening. And go back and sit in your row there. And we'll continue with the next hymn. The next hymn is number 568.
The grace, mercy, and peace, these are the wonderful blessings that we have in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's Word that we will be focusing on today, on a Sunday where we focus on the divine call, it is recorded in the Old Testament book of Amos, Amos chapter 7, beginning with verse 10. Then the Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people, Israel. And those are the words that we'll focus on this morning, dear friends. Please be seated. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow believers, one of the things that I do, I, I don't know if you really call it part of my job, but one of the things I do during this time of the year is I go up and I stress test the treehouse. So you know the treehouse in the backyard, it, um, it's out there full time in the weather, and it gets some hard use at some times of year, so I, I feel like it needs to be stress tested. Okay, so I go up there and I, you would, if you saw it, you'd think I had lost my mind, <laughs> but I uh, jump around and I, you know, every single board I jump on a couple of times, and all the railings I give a good wiggle, I kind of hang on them, I, I even ride the zip line a couple of times, you know, just to make sure, plus it's kind of fun to do, okay? So that's a stress test, isn't it? And I think that's important, you know, we really want to make sure before Vacation Bible School starts that, that everything is good. We want to make sure that we know what that treehouse is made of in terms of reliability and things like that. Today, in the text, this text from Amos, the divine call is really under the test. It's under a stress test. And under the, that stress, you know, Amos had a very stressful ministry. So under that stress, we really see what the divine call is all about. We see what it's made of. And so I thought that would be good for us. It just fit in so well with this Sunday. You know, we are installing, later on in the service, we're installing our Vacation Bible School teachers. Also, within a year, you will be issuing a divine call to your next pastor. So it's good for us to study this topic, the divine call, the divine call into the public ministry. So let's take a look at it. We'll put that up on the screen, the divine call, put to the test. And three things. First of all, we see it's the result of a special choosing. And secondly, it involves a special command. And then thirdly, it is fueled by the gospel. So the first point first, very important point, is the result of a special choosing. So as I mentioned before, the text for today revolves around the ministry of, of Amos, uh, the Old Testament prophet Amos. And this was during the time when the nation of Israel was really divided into two. So there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the southern kingdom consisted of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and Judah was the largest tribe by far. And so collectively, the Bible and us, we just call that the tribe of Judah, or the nation of Judah. And then the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, much larger area up there, uh, collectively we just call that Israel. So during this time in the history, there was Israel to the north, and there was Judah to the south. And Amos was really from the south, and he was called to go up north into Israel and be a prophet. Now, when he went up there, he got into some conflict because his job was basically to tell people to repent. So there was an evil priest up there, his name was Amaziah, and he had led the children of Israel to, into idolatrous worship. And Jeroboam, technically Jeroboam II, he was a very evil king, and he went along with this evil priest, 
And so did most of the people up there in the northern tribes, the kingdom of Israel. And so the big message that Amos had to preach was one of repentance. He just wanted the people to get to see their sin and to really repent. And uh, the message was not received very well, obviously, from Amaziah and the king and all the way down. So in a public way, the priest speaks to Amos and he says, get out. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there. Do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel. Bethel was the capital of Israel. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. And to this threat, to this threat to get out, Amos replied, he said, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. So essentially, what is Amos saying? You know, he's saying, look, I had a pretty happy life. I was a farmer. I was just minding my own business. I was farming. I was taking care of these fig trees. And the Lord called me to do this. I didn't make the decision to do this. The Lord decided that I should be here. So when you tell me to get out, you're really telling the Lord to get out. You're really finding fault with his decision. And, dear friends, every, every person in the public ministry, and again, let me be real clear, the person in the public ministry would be someone called to represent the group. So we naturally would think of our, of our pastor, the pastor of our congregation, think of me. Or we would also think of a councilman. The councilman has been called by God to represent the group, to represent the church. We would also think of a Sunday school teacher. They're in the public ministry for that year over that, that little class. A vacation Bible school teacher. A very limited form of the public ministry, but still a form of the public ministry. So that's the public ministry. And every person who's in the public ministry and has received, therefore, that divine call can say it was a divine call. It was a call from God. I did not make the decision to do this. But rather, God decided that I should do this. So sometimes it looks different. It looks different. So Karen, you have a son that's in the public ministry. And I'm sure at some point in time, he said, hey, I think I'm going to go and get the training. You know, he made that decision. That was his decision. I'm going to go get the, get the training. I think I'm going to go to the center. But then at some point in time, he gets a divine call. And that's a call from God. That's a call from God to call that person into the public ministry. Um, it's worked that way throughout the Christian church. In the, in the ancient city of Ephesus, they got, there was a large Christian church there. There are many congregations, many pastors, and they called pastors into the ministry in the same way that we do. The congregations would get together. They would say, we need a pastor. Who are we going to choose? They, a, a few names were brought up. They would vote on the name, and then as a group, they would issue that call, and then we say, that that person has been divinely called. Back in Old Testament times, those people were directly called by God. God would whisper in their ear, God would appear to them in a dream or a vision and call them. But in New Testament times, God calls his servants indirectly, but through the church. But it's still a divine call. We have these words from Acts chapter 20, for example, where the Apostle Paul is speaking. And he says to these pastors in Ephesus that I mentioned before, he says, keep watch over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Even though these men were called by the church, the Apostle Paul puts it in the right light. He says, these men were really called by God. God working through the joint decisions of the church. And of course, this is a very comforting thing. An extremely comforting thing. Every call worker realizes that he or she is a sinner. You know, we're working with the Word of God maybe a little bit more than the average person. And you see your sin a lot. I know I do. And so a lot of times I have this thought of, I'm not worthy. You know, I'm not worthy really to be a public minister because of my own sins. But then, for my comfort, I'm reminded of what the call is. It's, it's the result of God's decision. God decided that he wanted me to do this. God called.
called me into the public ministry. So it's a very comforting thing. It's also very comforting when there are accusations. So there's an old saying that's not in the Bible, but I think it's true. No good deed goes unpunished. You ever heard that before? No good deed goes unpunished. You, you try to do something good, and someone's going to find fault with that. See? So when that happens, and you're in the public ministry, maybe, Tom, you're working on the council, and, and you're accused of something. You're accused of doing something wrong. Or a Sunday school teacher, BBS teacher, the same thing. And you look at what you've done and say, I don't think I've done anything wrong. I think I'm just following God's word. When you're accused like that, then you always come back to the divine call and you say, God is the one who put me in this position. He decided that I should do what I'm supposed to do, and that is declare God's word. Even if people accuse me of, of sin, even if people accuse me of doing the wrong thing, I know in my heart I'm doing the right thing by following God's commands for a called work. So, well, what is the divine call? It's really the, the result of a special choosing. Special, gracious choosing by God. And it's also a very comforting when things are going right. I was talking to a, a woman that's going to be installed as a BBS teacher today. And um, just talking about BBS teaching in general. And she said, oh, pastor, you know, when, when we didn't do that last year, I really missed that. And two years ago, well, that was just the highlight of my year. You know, to sit down uh, at a table and have these four sets of eyes looking at me and saying, oh, teacher, tell me, tell me a story, tell me a story from the Bible, explain the Bible to me. It was just, it was just melted my heart. It was one of the best experiences of my life. So when things go well for a called worker, a called worker then should say, oh, how good and gracious my God has been to me that he would give me these wonderful rewards, rewards of the public ministry. So, once again, what's the divine call? The divine call is the result of a special choosing. It's not a human decision, really. It's a decision that comes from God. God chooses those people whom he wants to serve in the public ministry. He's the one, really, that issues the divine call. Now, the divine call is not only the result of a special choosing, it's also, it also involves a special command. And we're going to consider that in the second place very briefly. So I already told you a little bit about that special command of Amos. So Amos had a very difficult command. He was supposed to go up there, and he was supposed to talk to these really evil people. Amaziah, the priest, he's just a villain in the Bible. And he was supposed to then talk to Jeroboam the second. I have a listing of kings, the kings of Israel, in my study. And Jeroboam the second is listed as like, a king was especially bad. But that was a description. Especially bad. So he was supposed to go to those people and tell them to repent. And uh, the exact words of Amos are in our text. Amos said to them, Jeroboam will die by the sword. And Israel will surely go into exile. That's referring to what we call the Assyrian exile, which was very cruel. The Assyrians came in and they literally put hooks in the flesh of the Israelites and dragged them off to who knows where. The, the hooks were kind of closed in that northern kingdom of Israel. So Israel was surely going to exile away from their native land. So it was a very stern message. And God commanded Amos just to keep hammering home at that stern message for as long as it would take. And it took 30 years and the people still didn't listen, which which brings up the second difficult part of this call, that the people just didn't listen. They didn't respond. But Amos was called, he was given that command, to keep on doing it. Where did he get the energy for that? Well, he had a little rule in his mind. He said, when people won't listen to me, then I will listen to God. And in the call itself, God said, go prophesy to my people. So that's really amazing that God would call the people living up there in the northern kingdom, that he would say that they were my people. So after all those years of rejection, after this evil priest, this evil king, then God still says, they're my people, my precious people, the people from whom I intend someday to send a savior. And those words prophesied to my people that really melted the heart of Amos, and he 
he had a different attitude toward the people. He said, okay, these people might be kind of ugly on the outside, but God considers them to be his own precious people. And so I'm going to love those people. I'm going to continue to give them the word of God no matter what. In the Bible, Amos is kind of known as a plotter. What's a plotter? P-L-O-D-D-E-R, plotter. Well, plotter is just someone who keeps plotting along. <laughs> just keeps going and going and going. And I, 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 I kind of, I agree with that, but I also think that Amos should be known as someone who really loved souls. He had a soul love for these people. And that's the same kind of love that God commands us to have, really all Christians to have, but especially people who have a divine call, people who are in the public ministry. He says, you, you got to love people. You have to have a soul love for them, no matter what kind of cantankerous personality that soul is attached to. I remember in Milwaukee, where I grew up, there was a church, not my home church, but another neighboring Wells church, and the council was having a difficult time working with a certain member. A certain member was very rebellious and cantankerous. And one night that member went out and he got a bunch of spray paint. And you can imagine what he did with the spray paint. He spray painted the outside of the church, which was brick. He, he painted the outside of the, of the stained glass windows. He painted the door. And he wasn't just putting random marks. These were some pretty bad things he was putting on the church. And then he had the key, so he goes inside and does the same thing inside. The call of those councilmen was to love that soul. As difficult as that was, that was the call. Now, the, the best example of someone with soul love, of course, is Jesus Christ. What did he say when they were driving the nails? What did he say? Thank you all. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's the kind of love that we want. That's our goal, really for all Christians, but especially for those who have a divine call, is to have a soul love. So remember that, those of you that are going to teach vacation Bible school, when you got a wiggly little boy, you know, and he's got too much energy, and you wish you could have just one tenth of that energy for yourself, but this boy is just going off the walls, and he's kind of disturbing your class. Remember that you've received a call, and it's a special command, it is to love the souls of the people who are in your class. Councilman, when you, you're dealing with a difficult case, and maybe there's a member that complains about so many different things, and you're just about ready to tear your hair out, remember the command. The command is to love the soul of that person. And to those of you that don't have a divine call, you're not in the public ministry, then by all means, be a soul that's easy to love. <laughs> be a soul that's easy to love. you, you got to remember that these people that are in your church, on your council, serving as your pastor, they have this divine call to love you. Don't make it hard for them. Don't make it a burden for them. Make it easy for them to love you and to fulfill that special command. Well, no one really fulfills that command perfectly other than Jesus. You know, no one can fulfill that command perfectly because it's so difficult to do. Uh, the divine call, therefore, is fueled by the gospel. We don't have the power to fulfill it, but God really does in Jesus Christ. So if you remember the simple gospel, what does it say? It says that Jesus Christ lived in our place. What does that mean? That means that when we fall short, when we don't love human souls like we should, well, then we come back to the gospel and say, oh, wait a minute. What really counts to God is that Jesus did that in my place. He loved human souls in my place. And for all of my sins, he took those sins to Calvary's cross. So, like all Christians, the Christian who's received the call to the public ministry has to really rely on that gospel for his own personal forgiveness of sins. And also, when a called pastor or a called public a worker uh, goes into that and, and in that situation when he relies on the gospel, he's he's enlightened. He's 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 lifted up. He says, "Okay, I have Jesus Christ. It's a new day. Every day is a new day for me. I, I have forgiveness for my past sins, and, and now Jesus will be with me in the future." It's fuel for the ministry. 
So I think I, I speak for a lot of you, and I mentioned this in the uh, funeral sermon yesterday. I don't remember what the connection was yesterday, but today it's this connection. We get up in the morning, folks, and what do most of us do? 95% of us, we run for the coffee pot, right? I do. So you go to the coffee pot, you make the coffee, and then you get yourself your toast or your little scrambled egg or something like that. And where would you be without your coffee and your breakfast? I would be completely just dragged out and I'd have no energy. But with my coffee, with my toast, then I can go, I can make it. At least till noon, right? You know, I need that fuel. And the gospel is the fuel. It's the fuel really for all Christians. And therefore, it is also the fuel for anyone who's in the public ministry, anybody who has a divine call. All right, so we take a look today at what the divine call really is. And it's important. It's important for those who are in the public ministry. It's important for those of you that are served by public ministers. What is it? It's the result of a special choosing. It involves a special command to love the souls of people. That can be a challenge oftentimes, but it involves that special command. But then it is fueled by the gospel. So may God give us this correct understanding of the divine call so that the kingdom of God may flourish and expand. Amen. Will congregation please rise and we will confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, this being a Communion Sunday would be the Nicene Creed today. <coughs> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. We're going to hold off on the prayer of the church for right now because we're going to be uh, offering a prayer later on for our vacation Bible school. So uh, the Lord's Prayer is what follows. We'll say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So this time we'll have the installation of our BBS teachers. Will the BBS teachers uh, please come forward for the installation? And we'll just line up here where we would normally line up for... Holy Communion. So these are not all the, B the BBS teachers, I hope. Yeah. So um, I just uh, mentioned to you the entire list. So other than the ones that are present here, uh, Jeff Dewey, Nicole McGee, Jill Wyland. Jill Wyland's not actually a member of our congregation. She's a member of a neighboring congregation fellowship with us. Uh, Marlene Coleman. And Ashley Smith, Haley Hunt, Macy Dvorak, Caitlin Schrader, Teresa Hitz, and I'll also be serving as a VBS teacher. In addition to the people here, so we have Cheryl Miller, we have Ron Felice, we have Emily Pelka, and Tom Sanzo. Dear friends in Christ, you've been called as teachers in our Vacation Bible School. You are to re represent our congregation. You are to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are to do this in an effort to make disciples of all nations. 
and you are to feed the lambs of the Lord Jesus. And you are, again, to do this work on behalf of essentially evangelical Lutheran Church. You're really not acting on your own. You're acting as a representative of our congregation. So your work is both a great privilege and a serious responsibility to equip yourselves for this blessed work. It's necessary that you faithfully study God's word, devote yourselves to prayer for those entrusted to your care, and carefully prepare for the lessons that you will teach. It is also of great importance in the teaching of the Savior's word that you set an example by leading a Christian life. So I now ask you the presence of God and of this congregation, are you willing to accept this responsibility and to do your work faithfully according to the ability God has given you? And so the answer, yes, and I ask God to help me. Yes, and I ask God to help me. And I now install you as teachers in the Vacation Bible School of Ascension Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May God grant you his Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to carry out your duties to the glory and to the glory of God and for the good of his children. And members of Ascension Lutheran Church, I urge you to regard these teachers as servants of Jesus Christ. They are teachers of the Holy Gospel. They are God's gifts to the church. Support these teachers in their work. Pray for them. If you have children that are in that age group, bring them to Vacation Bible School so that you and your families may receive the eternal blessings that the Lord promises to those who hear and learn his word. And will the congregation please rise for a prayer? Gracious Savior, you bless every effort to study God's word in an organized way. We ask you to give wisdom, kindness, and perseverance to teachers who feed your lambs. Teach them your truth so that they may teach others. Cause the people entrusted to their care to be eager to learn about their Savior. May your goodness go out into all the earth so that people in this community and everywhere may hear it and believe it. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, dear teachers, you are now installed in our Vacation Bible School as official teachers. Go in the peace of the Lord, and may the Holy, uh, may the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and keep you. Amen. So you may return to your places now, and the congregation may be seated as well. We will continue with the order of the sacrament. The order of the sacrament. The words are on the screen for us. The Lord be with you.
which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
we will give thanks to God for the gospel, both in the form of the preached word and also in the form of the sacrament. Thank the Lord and sing his prayer.